Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. I hope all of you are well and healthy and safe this morning. And I want to welcome you to our daily natural health news live show here at Natural Health Resources, where I bring to you an assortment of health and wellness news surrounding COVID-19 and the coronavirus and updates and news that hopefully will help you make healthier decisions for you and your family. So welcome to all of you joining. Yesterday, I have to apologize, we had major glitches with YouTube. So I'm back. I'm actually going to repeat yesterday's show, some variation. I want to make sure we cover the points because it only captured about a minute and 55 seconds. So many of you who weren't able to transition over to Instagram uh, missed out on some really key factors to help you assess your COVID-19 risk uh, when it comes to the reopening, because I know a lot of you, and not everybody, but a lot of you are nervous. You have maybe underlying health conditions yourselves, or you're like us, where we have a family member in our immediate family that might have some additional uh, autoimmunity uh, challenges. And so it becomes really important that we equip ourselves and empower ourselves with knowledge and information. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to go over kind of an assessment of some points of, of risk levels in terms of the reopening, but also then I wanna more specifically go into your risk tolerance. And so welcome all of you. We've got JP Sosa on, hey JP up in Brooklyn, sent me the sweetest email uh, this weekend. So thank you so much, that brightened my day, I'm grateful. And for all of you, we've got Pat back on the uh, moderating here on YouTube and um, hopefully we won't have any challenges with our connectivity. But I'm very excited to have all of you join me again. And in the event that something happens, Instagram is always a great resource and never fails on me. So I'll knock on my fake wood <laughs> here that it continues to be that. But I want to highlight, they didn't even get any love yesterday, but I want to highlight yesterday's video sponsor. And so I'm carrying them over into today, Lumen Multicollagen. They are a really fantastic multi-collagen, actually five-part um, collagen supplement. It's in these wonderful clear capsules. Uh, yesterday I had questions. You can break those open and put those in yogurts and whatnot. These are not vegan, but they are GMO-free. They're free of a lot of toxins. They're soy-free, gluten-free. Um, they contain a five, what they call five-phase multi-collagen complex. It's comprised of bovine collagen, uh, bovine bone broth, protein, marine collagen. You guys know, I've talked a lot about this. I'm a huge fan of marine collagen. It also has chicken bone broth and then eggshell membrane collagen. What I love about this is the addition of the bone broth. You get so many additional nutrients in this. Um, and the very, the very bone broth, you get the beef bovine bone broth and the ch chicken bone broth. So you get a really power punch of nutrients. So this is Lumen. They actually have an amazing discount. So I've got a, a link down below, coupon code, it's 15% off, uh, Lumen NHR. So check those out. I wanna give them lots of love this morning. Collagen is great for a lot of things. It's great for digestive health, skin health, hair and nails, even uh, concentration, your brain function, and most importantly, sleep, which many of you have been challenged with sleep during this quarantine time. So uh, good morning to all of you. <clears throat> I want to go through some news today. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we are going to look at as a country is going to be the reopening of other countries. So some of the news I want to report is some of the reopening procedures and uh, data that's coming out of countries like France and Italy. So let's dig into our numbers. The world has 4.8 million cases. The U.S. is at 1.5 million. Um, New York itself has 351,000 cases. Out of that number, 191,000 cases in New York are um, based in New York City. And I pulled data, I failed to print it, I apologize, but um, there is data that look, looks at New York City. Specifically, it reveals the different boroughs and the neighborhoods. And what they're finding is the greater uh, quantity of cases in many cases, but also the um, the death, the percentage of deaths per the, you know, per capita of cases 
are higher in socioeconomic neighborhoods where there are black and Latino neighbor neighborhoods. So those communities are being more heavily hit. And this is very synonymous with what we're seeing here in Georgia, where it was like 86% of the population who have tested positive and are uh, being hospitalized are the Black and Latino community, primarily Black or African-American communities here in, in Atlanta. So we're seeing the same, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got total allergies with all this rain. Um, one of the things that has kicked up, now New York has a little bit more time and focus to be able to assess some of the data. So they're pulling all of the data. We're going to hear more and more, but I really appreciate that because it helps us <clears throat> just globally assess what neighborhoods and communities need more support, where do we need to put testing, where do we need to educate and communicate ways to keep them safe. And the challenge here, so we go back to the socioeconomic component, and a lot of these individuals are frontline workers. So we have to make sure that we we take care of those folks. And Jenny from DeBlock uh, says the Bronx has been hit hard in New York City. Absolutely. And it is just devastating. <clears throat> so New Jersey they're at 148,000. Illinois is our state to watch. They're at 96. They have been moving up very quickly. <clears throat> and even in a day, they put up over 2,000 cases. So they're at 94 yesterday. They're at 96 today. Massachusetts um, is also on the incline. They're at 87,000. California is at 78,000. And I want to report in California. I know I have a lot of you morning viewers that get up and watch me live in California. Um, there is a county called, I think it's Boot or Butt, I don't know, but it's B-U-T-T-E County. Um, there is a church, even despite the orders for staying at home, the church held a service, small church, but people were packed in for Mother's Day. So this is just a few weeks ago. Okay, so Mother's Day service, one individual was in the in the service that was positive. He actually, he or she, I don't know who they are, so I don't want to discriminate, but they tested positive the following day. So they, they got their test results back and they potentially have put 180 people at risk. So that is their uh, potential contamination and, you know, from shaking hands, hugging or being in close proximity, you know, obviously the church probably had more than 180 people, but we also saw more recently um, a a priest has passed um, because the church service, uh, you know, church was reopened and um, several cases have, have been found in that one, one community. So this goes again to the high risk communities. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today, just to cover where you, you want to assess your risk as things reopen, where, wh what is safe and what is not. And, you know, virtual services are held everywhere. There's a lot of opportunity for us to stay safe and still consume our spiritual guidance and uplifting uh, messages throughout the week and even on Sundays. So Pennsylvania, I just want to highlight a few other states. Pennsylvania is at 63,000. Michigan is at 51,000. Texas is at 48. Um, and they they moved up uh, just a little bit, but they definitely had a bad weekend where they put up almost 2,000 new cases. Maryland is at 39 and Georgia is at 38. Um, I want to highlight some some points. We are not calculating this in you know the daily reports, and I have to admit I'm not doing that as well. Um, the Navajo Nation has a substantial amount of positive cases and per capita. So based on the population of the, within the Navajo Nation, the population per capita. So the amount of people per every thousand that um, have the virus, um, they're the greatest. Unfortunately, the Navajo Nation has the greatest per capita uh, versus uh, even... New York City. So for every, I think it's 10,000 cases or 10,000 individuals, 2,300 um, have, have that in the Navajo Nation, whereas New York, it's 1806 and New Jersey, it's 1668. So that is not good for the Navajo Nation community. And there are more, um, there is more focus and effort to at least get testing and some resources to them. Um, yesterday, I think I failed to report this. Um, and if, and even if I did, it, it just the, the, 
YouTube was just so bad yesterday. Um, the Amazon has documented its first case. So COVID-19 has hit an Ecuadorian Amazon Amazonian tribe. So in the country of Ecuador, you know, there's a lot of city, a lot of countries that have the Amazon um, or uh, Amazon inhabits multiple countries. The Ecuadorian part of the Amazon, there is a tribe that has tested positive. Part of that is uh, very much linked to the mining that's happening and the exposure from the bigger cities. And that is devastating. And in fact, today I read that there is going to be a, a field hospital set up in the Amazon because these tribes particularly are ill-prepared and have zero immunity. They've been hit hard with a lot of the other viruses like pox and smallpox and um, uh, uh, tuberculosis and other really intense uh, viruses. So we're gonna, I'm gonna keep an eye on that as I get information. Um, a week ago, France started to reopen. You know, they've been in the reopening phase for the last few weeks, but last week they sent 1.4 million children back to classrooms. And, you know, as a parent with a child, this is our last week in school. And um, by the way, Gabriel's uh, drum, uh, <laughs> his little drum solo got accepted into the talent show. Woo -woo. So I'm very excited. My little four and a half year old is going to be in the the, uh, the virtual recording uh, that they're going to put together of um, children's talent where he drums on my yoga ball chair with spatulas, which one of them he broke <laughs> later in the day. But I'm very excited. But in, at any rate, um, you know, for parents, we're watching. We want to see what's going on. So in France, 1.4 million students went back a week ago. Already, they have 70 new cases in schools. And that's alarming because how many of those folks, you know, how many of those kids may be asymptomatic? How many of the teachers? So it, the big question mark is what's going on there? But that is telling. And they have minimized groups preschool 10 or less children in little groups and no more than 12 or 15 in smaller pods for elementary, middle and high school. So that's very, um, that, that is going to be kind of interesting. Now, the other thing that came out of Australia that I want to highlight, I'm not going to give a lot of credence to it because the data is taken before their quarantine and then during quarantine where kids are homeschooled, but they showed, you know, a small, like, one to two percent risk of transmission but then the report said well half of the time or more than half of the time kids were in homeschool i don't consider that to be counting in terms of kids transmission especially when they're in lockdown just like us so i think we're going to wait and see what else happens i do want to stay stay in the world of schools the university of notre dame here um, has declared that they are going to resume in-person classes they are going to start a lot sooner than typical. They're going to start mid-August and they are going to finish classes before Thanksgiving break with the idea that they might be able to get away from the traditional cold and flu season. So we will see what happens. I know, uh, actually, I have a lot of friends who are alum from Notre Dame. Um, Brian and, and actually both our university, our undergrad universities are ACC. So we play Notre Dame all the time. I've never been up there, but um, I'm curious to see what happens. I know kids pay a lot of money for that school, and that's a big concern for children. Or, you know, a, a post high school graduate students are concerned, these young adults, uh, that virtual classes are not going to be worth the amount of money they're paying in to college tuition nowadays. It's so insane. Um, so we'll see what happens there, but that's at least the first school that's really pushing forward in the university world. I do want to highlight there's still a lot of disgruntled individuals uh, very upset about uh, the closing and lockdown. And there was a gentleman in Nashville who he's a homeless man. He was not able to get supposedly into the, this this um, uh, homeless shelter, although they say they were open. Um, he was frustrated, went to his storage center where he apparently has a storage unit with a machete, wielded a machete, got it out of storage, wielded it, 
and got mad and just took it out on two innocent people sitting in the lobby of the storage center, uh, a couple in their uh, mid fifties and they're both hospitalized. They have not been, they have not died of the injuries um, thus far, but he is being charged and now he is having the ultimate of lockdowns in jail. So it's just crazy um, that people have to feel that intense. Um, obviously there's probably some mental health challenges there, but regardless, there's a lot of angst and a lot of frustration. And yesterday I highlighted, um, some information and I'll highlight this again, where we have to be really cognizant of the information we absorb and consume. And particularly in the world of social media, there's a lot of infographics that are completely, uh, not based in facts and are not scientifically founded but look like they are. And I also wanna highlight that we have, for instance, like Georgia, the Department of um, Health released, uh, initially last week, they released these numbers that said, these are the top five counties in our state. And look, these numbers are going down. So we've reopened and our numbers are going down. But if you look closely, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm gonna read off just the order, okay? And just notate the date differentials. Starts off with April 28th, then April 27th, April 29th, May 1st, April 30th, May 6th, May 4th, May 5th, April 25th, May 2nd, May 7th, April 26th, uh, May 3rd, May 8th. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. You can't have numbers that are chronological not be chronological. So what happened is the Department of Health, who knows who directed them to do this or why they would do this, but they literally altered the axis down here to suit the idea that we have a lessening of cases. Now, from a passerby, you look at this and go, George is lowering their cases. I don't need to wear masks. I'm going out. I'm going to go shopping. I'm hitting the gym. I'm going to get a massage. I'm getting my hair dyed. Okay, well, that's not really factually oriented. You have to look closely. This is the reality. We had some dips, and then we had some spikes. And the way this matches up, this is directly two, two and a half weeks after the reopening happened. We saw an increase. And then we saw a little decrease. And now we've got a little increase again. But the greatest point of increase was right here, two weeks after reopening. This is the problem with a lot of the data. So you just have to look a little bit further. And uh, critical thinking is going to be critical. Uh, literally, if we assess, okay, what data, you know, infographics should have, if they're going to say this CT scan uh, and the mask wearer have been deemed to... Um, develop pneumonia from wearing masks or have had a decrease in oxygen and they list all these numbers. If there is no citation, that is, that's not an accurate assessment. If you're not going to notate your science behind it, which you should be proud, you know, the, the individuals who make these infographics, that is a truthful infographic when there's citations or notations. Um, but when that doesn't happen, that is an indicator, a very quick, easy indicator that that information is not accurate and false. And I see a lot of people pushing a lot of false narratives and false information, um, sometimes unknowingly, but we have to really refrain, especially from the mask issue. So I'm going to say it here. For any of you who doubt mask wearing is successful, more and more research, more and more data is coming out that showcasing a two layer mask, like my friend, the ones that my friend makes, where it's adjustable around the nose, you can tie it and, and cinch it in. Um, and also has an insert for a carbon five layer carbon filter filters like this, that's actually very safe. And it not only protects you, it protects other people. Most importantly, it's about other people. So we have to kind of take our selfish hat off and put on our selfless mask to help other people. And there's a study that even the least effective mask, so one layer, um, if 60% of individuals across the US wore them, this is statistically founded. So there's a study and I'll post, I highlighted it last week. 60% of Americans wore masks as they're going about our day. We'd actually decline this, the risk factor. So we would literally get rid of the virus in its explosive nature. So um, preach so many of my friends post things that aren't just not true. So I think one of the things that we have to do 
I've, I have to admit, I've not been one to ruffle feathers. I am not, it's not in my nature to like call people out or be combative. Um, but I think nowadays, um, one of the things that we have to do is we have to call BS because it's now at the level where it's negligent and it can be deadly. Asymptomatic carriers, we know some populations, as we've seen, you know, almost 100% of the folks that were tested up in Massachusetts in a, a homeless shelter were asymptomatic, roaming around without masks. So, and I saw last word, you're a total jerk. So I, let's refrain from nastiness and comments. And thanks, Pat, for hiding the uh, commentary. If, if you don't agree or you, if you choose not to agree or even listen to research, science, and data and statistics, which is scientifically proven, it, it is just asinine. If you wear a seatbelt when you drive your car, then you should be perfectly fine wearing a safety mask. It's the same thing. You haven't been involved in an accident, accident, but you want to save your life. And you also want to save the lives of your children or your passengers and keep it safe for everybody. So anybody who has no problem wearing a seatbelt should have no problem wearing a mask. Okay. That's what I'm, I'm saying on that. But I do think it is important that we have to get we have to call BS on it. So I'd say for Melissa Renee, which by the way, that's my name, Melissa Renee Gallagher. Um, <clears throat> and I was born in 1978. So I think that's great. Um, one of the things that we really have to do is we have to call it out. And it's most important that we cite the facts and the data because people cannot run from true data and there's no argument against it. So you know, it, it, it is, it's just one of those things that there's just so much at play. And I don't know why we're politicizing and creating this stupid buzz about masks uh, taking away their freedoms. Safety belts don't take away people's freedoms. But we found through research and a lot of deaths that it was safer for people to protect themselves. This is no different. In fact, it's actually going to benefit our greater good and, and speed up the process of all of us all getting back to normal and lowering the need or the requirement or all the research to be doing all these vaccines, which I know a lot of people are against and, and that is, I'm tabling that conversation. Um, but it's important. Um, and last word says, you've got a president who is saying, take a drug that the FDA says that is dangerous. Absolutely. And, and that is, the, you know, the FDA unfortunately has put out warnings to him. If it were me, if I were to say that, I'd get taken down off of YouTube and I'd be censored and all of my certifications, credentialing, licensure, business would be evaluated and I'd be put out of business. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen. We need to take it upon ourselves to educate ourselves and our friends and family members. So um, it's huge. Okay, so let's do this. Um, yeah, and I, I understand, you know, there's Ray Flow, you know, the FDA says weed is bad. There's there's a lot to that, okay? So, um, and, and regardless of your standings with WHO, CDC, FDA, we have intelligent thought and we have critical thinking skills. We don't necessarily need a government or a local, like local state officials to tell us, you know, to do certain things. We just have to inherently assess the, the data and statistics and then make certain choices. And that is what today is all about. So I'm coming to you as an educational medium, as a resource to highlight things to consider, your risk tolerance, the risk factors. Um, so on the kind of movement of my information, I want to highlight for you. Um, one of the things that now is being pushed is for anybody who has any type of mild symptoms, like maybe a little sore throat that's abnormal from your normal, like, um, you know, allergy, like I have my little allergy thing going on usually in the morning after the dogs come in and I get the fresh pollen. Um, what they're saying is that 40%, less than 40% of individuals have a fever. So the whole idea of, you know, us doing, I don't have my, oh yeah, I do. Usually Gabriel plays with this. He took the, the thing off the back recently. Um, you know, doing temperature checking as you go into offices is, is good, but that's not going to catch 60 plus percent of individuals who are asymptomatic. And so while that is nice, it makes us feel safe. 
it's truly not making us safe. Oh, it's Melissa. Oh my gosh, Melissa, that's funny. I didn't know that your middle name. So Melissa Renee on Instagram, she and I went to high school together. Oh, I'm so glad you tune in every day. I didn't know that was you. Yay. Um, okay, so <clears throat> one of the things that we really want to assess are your milder symptoms. And nowadays, that's really important. Um, to it's really important to assess those milder symptoms that might not be your normal seasonal allergy. So like a sore throat or a runny nose or, you know, the COVID toes, rashes, um, you know, kind of unique, even some of the cardiovascular elements. So if you monitor your blood pressure, let's say you have hypertension, you're monitoring your blood pressure, your levels with medication are fine. And all of a sudden they start like elevating significantly, and it's not necessarily due to stress, that might be an indicator go, to go get a test. So, th and the other thing too is, and why I posted on Instagram on the post itself, I listed some items that you want to grab. Like this is really critical, this type of uh, oxygen monitor, because a lot of times people have been walking around with the beginnings of the lung disruption and the viral infection of the lungs and they're at really low levels, like 20s and 30s, and they're perfectly fine. And it that's what blew the minds of ER and ICU doctors, where these people were functioning fine. It looked like they were at altitude, and yet their oxygen levels were absolutely terrible. So there are some measurements that you can take. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to push. Now we have better capacity in some areas. We have greater access and there's more testing materials. So we're starting to finally see that ease up a little bit, but then people aren't going to get tested. And actually yesterday I had listed some of the reasons why there's testing challenges. Some areas, the, the, the daily capacity is there. So in one area it said we have a daily capacity for 9,000 tests, but we're only running 3,000. Well, there's not enough participants. And they actually listed in an evaluation of why people are not going. Cost is one factor. So this is not free, even though we've been kind of touted as this is free. So, you know, this could be anywhere from a hundred to a few hundred dollars. Maybe there's a copay depending on where you get your test. So that's one. Two, there's skepticism about the test. So is it going to be accurate? Um, the other thing is if, and also what type of test? People are getting really nervous about this whole, you know, uh, nasal swabbing. It's not bad. Their saliva, this, their serum. I personally would rather do saliva in the nose, but most importantly, we want to do what's most accurate. So the accuracy also, it fields the, the skepticism. Then access points. What they're finding is that in the points, those communities like New York City, and um, I'll, I'll post on my Instagram stories. I, I did a screenshot and wasn't able to print it. I will post on my Instagram story so you can see the New York map, but they've got the um, they've got the the different neighborhoods and you know districts and communities in different colors based on where the tests where, where the greater quantity of, of cases have has been. Then they you can actually look at it and it changes in terms of you know those who've been hospitalized, those who have you know had an emergency room visit, those who have died. And that's where they're assessing the areas, the communities, and then they get into the details of the socioeconomic, you know, the racial components and the discrepancies there. Well, that's a great tool for now the New York, New York City and the health department to actually put testing in those areas. Because if you are in one area, let's, and I don't know the, the geography as well as Jenny and, and some of the others who live in New York, but if you put a testing area, not in your core kind of central outbreak, and you require people to travel on transport, which they're trying to avoid, you're not going to have people show up. So that's another factor. Um, and, and then just, you know, overall, a lack of desire to even be potentially more exposed was another factor. Um, okay, so Meg... Uh, Magomia, if someone has POTS, which can have lower O2 levels, can the oximeter still indicate possible COVID? Yes. Yeah, so I work with a lot of POTS and um, really intense cases of histamine responses. And, you know, you'd have to evaluate. Generally, you have a range and you know when you're in a flare what your range is. So the big thing would be lowering stress, minimizing your flares, most importantly, but then evaluating the O2 levels. 
you know, mid nineties, low nineties might be normal, but if you're dropping to like 60, 50, those are indicators, but yes, definitely want to use this and monitor. And your best point is to get a journal and every day. So if there's any kind of health indicator or underlying health concern where you are taking blood pressure and monitoring certain value values, blood sugar is another one. You want to see if there are trends. And what's great is the phone has apps. Now you just plug in. Sometimes you can do your tests on the app and it starts to calculate. You can start to evaluate some things. Um, okay. Uh, you're welcome. Let's see. Um, so first of all, I just want to mention Lumen again. Lumen is uh, was yesterday's video sponsor that nobody was able to see because YouTube didn't record it fully. Um, but they have, they're a multi-collagen uh, provider. They come in this cute little pink box. It's five different types of collagen, two types of uh, bone broth in that. So it's really complete and very, very um, full. It, it, it's highly enhanced with both collagen, but also amino acids and other highly beneficial nutrients from the bovine and the chicken bone broth. In addition to you, the bo bovine collagen peptides, the marine uh, collagen peptides, and then they also have the eggshell uh, membrane collagen. So very beneficial. Um, and I love, I love collagen, especially if we have any type of autoimmunity where it's soft tissue related and inflammatory. A lot of times the gut's a major component. So healing the gut's key and collagen can bridge that gap. Um, Carol St. Andrews says, I'm pretty sure that I had it in March. I had a little cough and felt like my lungs were a bit burned, like ran in 40 degree weather all March and April just went away. O2 levels were always 96 to 99. And I was really tired. It's possible. I mean, you may want to do an antibody test um, when it's when it's option when it's optional. Um, and last words that I thought I had it in November. It's very possible. I think one of the things that we ha have to kind of assess um, the antibody tests. There are some that are not accurate. Like Abbott is getting a lot of flack because of its lack of accuracy. But there are others that might be more accurate. And one of the things that we have to assess is evaluating when you do get that, that might indicate you had exposure. Um, it might indicate that that scenario either in November or in March was truly a COVID-19 uh, exposure. <clears throat> it may or may not, um, but it may or may not also indicate you have immunity. What we are not sure is the immunity factor. And yesterday I was reading that <clears throat> there were um, I didn't fully report this this morning, um, the Theodore Roosevelt, you know, they had over, you know, hundreds of cases of the, even the captain that got booted from the ship, he had, he tested positive. It was, you know, big to do in, uh, you know, March and April, there were, I want to say 17 cases, um, uh, th these individuals recovered test, you know, two tests negative, they go home they go to go back on the ship, they tested positive again. So I don't know what that's about. And, you know, my take, and I was telling this to Brian, you know, they were in the South Pacific. That strain of the virus is the Chinese strain. We know that the American strain here is the European strain because, you know, the New York travel was the main component. So we have some Seattle is, you know, some Chinese strain influence, but the majority of our major outbreak, not just in America, but we see it in Canada and other countries, it's the, um, it's the European strain, the Italian and the Spanish strain. So my question is, well, maybe they've been exposed to now, you know, they come back, they come back to a COVID unit. You know, we would take precautions, but obviously there's going to be potential risk and then their immune systems weekend. Have they come into contact with the new strain? That's that's the question I ask. Nobody's said that, but it makes me wonder. Um, okay, so uh, Dwayne says, I use an oximeter every day, oxygen level 97, no temp. My biggest issue on my second strep, my throat is sore, so I'm assuming it's just strep, not COVID. Um, it's po it, it's possible, you know, if you've been tested strep, that's obviously a factor. The other thing um, that I want to highlight is that c with COVID-19, there are one or more, so it could be a multitude of secondary infections, like strep throat, pneumonia is a secondary infection. 
uh, you know, the kidney failure, the heart arrhythmias, those are all secondary conditions. So it's possible for there to be one and then for there to be um, another element at play. So, you know, I think it's one of those things, just make sure you support your immune system. The real Charlie Orange says, is collagen okay for people with the MTHFR mutation? So I, what I appreciate in the food-based collagen, especially like the bone broth additives, um, I feel like food is a much better way to integrate collagen into our body than just a pure isolated extract, uh, which is one of the reasons why I like lumen. But it's one of those things, everybody's MTHR is a little bit more unique in terms of how they process items. The beauty of having a collagen supplement that has bone broth in it is you get those amino acids that can help break down that collagen peptide protein to integrate it better. So that's a possibility. Okay, so let's keep going with some info. Mm. I have to tell you, this is kind of funny. So I was washing my mug the other day and I lost the I and E. So I'm no longer in quarantine. <laughs> We are still, we're still in very much what we call phase zero, very strict, but I thought this is kind of sad. My little quarantine mug lost the I and E, uh, the I and the N, um, as I was uh, probably too aggressively washing it. So, um, okay. One of the things that I want to highlight, um, is the other point of news is that we are now the Mod Moderna is the um, kind of main leading charge on the human trial of vaccines. The first phase, very small sample size, less than 10 people have um, taken the, the, the virus um, and they are showing a level of immunity and antibodies equivalent to those who have had it. So the antibodies that they see in their bodies um, it, it's the immune system response is good. So <clears throat> what that means is the group age group 25 to 54. So that's that phase one, the next phase. And I don't know the chronological order, but I knew, I do know this is happening at rapid speed and we'll probably see them go through phase two and three, probably in the next two to three months. Phase two will now move from the age group. We're going to do 55 to 71. So then there'll be a new group of people, new exposure and see how they do. And then phase three is going to be 71 and older. And then phase four actually includes thousands of individuals. So there'll be a set quantity of people. Um, there will be the folks that are not um, fully exposed. Um, and, and well, I don't know what they're, I, this will be kind of the interesting question as this is moving really quickly. Um, I don't know what the requirements are to get into the trial, um, but they probably will be antibody testing people because they're not going to want to have those people have any influence on this, but it's pretty risky. Um, but I think when it gets, if it can get to phase four, that is very positive. Um, and it's pretty like mind blowing how fast this is going. This is abnormal. This usually takes 10 to 15 plus years. Um, Okay, so I want to highlight. So yesterday I mentioned several things. I want to run through uh, some categories of activities as you start to reopen and to consider um, as you maybe start to venture out or considering like what's what's okay, what is safe, or what's less risky. So risk assessment is critical to keep you keeping you healthy and well. Then the other factor I want to highlight, and I actually posted this on my Instagram stories yesterday. Um, this is a risk tolerance. And this is um, from a clinician that is in my network, Evelyn Docker. Um, and it really assesses like the COVID risk tolerance. And so you can, uh, you can put yourself in a risk tolerance. So you can kind of evaluate like how, how okay are you with the risk category? We here in our household are in this category because Brian has an autoimmune disorder. So this puts, this is where we're at. So I'll, let's start with this today first. And then, you know, based on you get a number in your head of what you kind of feel comfortable with. And then that would kind of base where you're at with, um, with potentially getting a little bit more risky or lowering your risk. So very strict falls into the number one category. And this is 
people, you stay within a container, your home, you're in your kind of staying at home, maintain six feet of distance, no outside contact, uh, strict infection control protocol, and no contact with the outside world. This could be you in an apartment, a condo in New York. It could be you like us where we're just in our little lockdown. I haven't I still, I forgot to drive my car the other day. I need to drive my car because apparently my tires and transmission might get impacted. Which by the way, I didn't realize that happens, but Brian's like, you need to drive your car. So at some point today, I'm going to just do some laps around our, our, our city. Um, so we are in this category, which means I am going to do only low risk activities because we are limiting our potential risk. Now, strict number one, falls into leaves your container for essentials. So you go to the grocery store, you maintain six feet of distance outside of your container when you leave for essentials. You use strict etiquette, including hand washing, you are wearing a mask and you're social distancing. Use 100% of the time when out of the container. You walk your dog in your neighborhood, you're wearing your mask. If you're going uh, to pick up your pharmaceuticals, you're wearing a mask which by the way, they're still doing drive through at most of those. Um, and you're not socializing outside of your container. So you're still in a social lockdown. Fairly strict. This is number two. So this is kind of the middle. There's two middle points here. First middle point is you leave the house only to go to work and for essential. So fairly strict number two are folks that are working outside the home. You leave the house out only to go to work and for essentials. You're fairly strict etiquette, including hand washing, mask, and social distancing used 80 to 99% of the time. So you're not doing it every time, but 80 to 90% outside the home and outside of your container. Um, you minimize grocery and other shopping and you socialize with others outside of the container. So maybe you're socializing at the pool or have, you know, family socializing within family. Now three, this is where we start to move into the open category. So somewhat open, this is our middle space. So this is, the, this is where we turn the corner. These folks are way more open. Somewhat open, number three, leaves the container to exercise, to go to the store, to work and other activity, activities several times a week. Etiquette, including hand washing, masks, and social distancing are used anywhere between 60 to 79% of the time when outside the container. So there's less and less mask. Sometimes socializes uh, with other, so socializes others who are not in our container. So with others, tries to maintain social distance with, the, with no more than 10 people. So, um, you know, if you have a little gathering, a little birthday gathering, small group of people, or you go out to a restaurant and there's three or four couples that would fall in soup. Uh, number four, moderately open. These are folks that leave the container, you're exercising, going to store, work, and other activities multiple times a week. So big difference from several to multiple times. The etiquette, including hand washing masks and social distancing are used only 20 to 59%. So even lowered mask wearing. Uh, regularly socializes with others who are not in one's container. So, you know, more frequent socialization and may not maintain social distance and see more than 10 people. So this is definitely, I, I get nervous about these categories. So some of our protesters are falling into this category. And, um, you know, the, the folks that are working in social settings, you're working, but you're not wearing a mask. You know, you're only masking 20 to 59% of the time you'd be in that open four category. Okay, now the other one, this is the last one, very open, number five. No precautions to protect self from infection. So no hands, no masks. Uh, may desire to get infected, which is kind of interesting, the psychological aspect of that. Actively socializes without regard to social distancing or recommended etiquette. And this, the her recommendation is this level must take strong, strong precautions to reduce the risk to others. Um, so I'm curious out of this, where does everybody fall? Are you a zero like we are? Are you a one? Are you strict? Are you fairly strict? Are you somewhat open? Are you moderately open? Are you very open? And depending on where you fall in this category, and YouTube, this might be reversed, I apologize. Uh, depending on where you fall in this category, this is one of those things where 
you might want to take precautions. And so, you know, these very open folks are okay with some of the high risk. So, and then moderate might not be okay with high risk, but you might be okay with medium high risk. It's just kind of one of those components. Uh, yeah. So the question level five doesn't wash their hands anymore. You know, the thing is that a lot of people don't, this is horrible, but you know, more so of like any type of engagement wash, you know, the, the proactive washing their hands, you know, they probably wash their hands after they went to the, the, the restroom, but maybe not after they've been in a social setting, open doors and stuff. And then they touch their nose, their mouth and their eyes. Um, so let's go into some high risk uh, areas. Uh, first of all, I want to mention in any of these settings, um, high risk means uh, high touch items. And so anything that is going to be touched heavily by a multitude of people in a short period of time. Counters, checkout counters, bathroom doors, bathroom handles, faucet handles, stair, rail, stair rails, st stair railings, um, elevator buttons, uh, you know, mailboxes, things, you know, door handles, things that have a lot of high touch frequency, shopping carts. Um, so those are things that can be high risk if you or even the business and collectively, we all should be cleaning those. So, you know, the protective gloves, having sanitizing wipes, you know, when you're out and about, having hand sanitizer with you, uh, really critical. Okay, so some high risk activities, gathering with family and friends. Um, and this is kind of in the five, 10 or more category. And yesterday I highlighted, you guys who follow me on Instagram caught this, but one of the things that I really talk about is in the high risk category, especially when we're gathering with friends, we have to take the same mental assessment that we have in the world of STDs. So you have to kind of assess the risk factor, riskiness of engaging with people that might be also engaging with other people. And it's very similar. And I know it sounds really crazy because these are our family and friends and like, oh my gosh, STDs are horrible. This is a virus and it's an unseen virus. And a lot of people are asymptomatic, unaware of the carrying of these viruses. There are a lot of STDs that are asymptomatic. So, you know, the question is of these folks you might be gathering with, are they wearing masks? Who have your friends come into contact with? And who have they come into contact with? So it's like three, five, six degrees of, of points of measurement. Are they staying at home? It's big different if there's, you know, a very strict couple coming together with another very strict couple and they've been very strict for several weeks. There's a likelihood that that's a very safe engagement and they wear masks and they wash hands and they do social distancing. Okay. That's a totally different setting than going to a restaurant with eight people. Very different. And those people also are going to church and doing all these other high risk activities. Um, and, you know, going to that point, so activity points that are high risk, bars, bars are a big category of high risk. The major point that makes it risky, just like STDs is alcohol. So alcohol can dumb down and lower the decision making and hinder that capacity to ask those questions or even be cognizant of touching things that might not be safe. Um, religious functions fall into their high risk category. I mentioned today in California, I mentioned the priests that passed, the, they're still high risk. Um, unfortunately, movie theaters and sporting events, any point where you're sitting and you're getting exposure, those are high risk categories and long-term exposure. So like a restaurant, if you're gathering with friends at a restaurant, you decide to be there for an hour or a half, that's high risk. It's different if you gather outside in an outdoor setting and socially distance, very big difference. And you see them for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, medium high risk gyms are in this category and uh, mask wearing is really, this is where I'm, I'm getting really kind of frustrated seeing a lot of video of gyms opening and the owners of the gyms, the fitness instructors and the, um, the uh, participants in these classes and CrossFit or whatever are not wearing masks. Here's the thing, professional athletes wear a whole bunch of contraptions. And I mentioned yesterday, I worked with this professional athlete, okay? She's a superstar, a rock star. We'll go hands down as the best tennis athlete we've ever had in, in our generation. 
She trains under some crazy circumstances, as do professionals like Lance Armstrong and other folks that are cardio fitness focused. They train and simulate high altitude. Some of that's really like literally cinching their nose and breathing through their mouth and minimizing their oxygen intake. But that supports their body to function better when they are absorbing oxygen. That's you and I, we are not (laughs) professional athletes like that, but Wearing a mask will not cause you to suffocate. You are not going to pass out of lack of oxygen and you're not going to have any type of crazy situation where you develop pneumonia from wearing a mask while working out. And one of the things that if you can wear a mask when you work out, that's better. There's a challenge in here. The gym classes, like that's what I take. My gym is one of these bike, uh, real intense, high intensity training. Like we're going all the time, all different types of equipment. And then we do yoga, the yoga part, totally very easy to do a mask, the bike I'm sweating and, and then I'm drinking a lot. So that'd be kind of challenging. I'd be taking my mask on and off and my hands would be touching. And then, you know, the working out with the intensity, um, that might also play into a role in terms of the sweating. It's not always convenient. Where if you're doing free rates, free weights, that's very different. So what they're asking is gyms, if we can have people wear masks, that's safer. Indoor restaurants, indoor dining is very different. There's a medium risk in out, indoor dining. There's less risk for outdoor dining. So if you are dining inside, you want to make sure you wear a mask. You for sure want to make sure that the professionals serving you and everybody working at that business are wearing masks. There are companies uh, and restaurants that are not wearing masks. They're not requiring it of their staff. That would be one of those ones where I would not pay and patronize them uh, for, for the lack of, 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 of health safety. Um, and the other thing too, is they want to, one of the things that can make it high risk is if they're not using disposable items. So they're not using disposable glassware, uh, cutlery, plates, menus because the menus are high touch you know you even like the laminated menus how many of you gone to and i'm being from florida we used to go to a ton of these beach bars they're all like crunkled up it's halfway open you know it's faded out from the sun <laughs> you can get one of these you can have these printed out really easy and cheap put it at the you know person's uh table and throw that out that's safer than touching a reused um menu and you might not see that at high-end restaurants, but everybody is making precautions. Um, Okay, so medium risk. Let's talk about medium risk. So in that category, hair salons and nail salons and gathering with a couple of friends are in that medium risk. And again, any friend gathering, you've got to ask those STD-related questions. You know, who have they been with? Geography, where are they located? Are they coming from a city that's higher? Because a lot of times people congregate and they're coming from certain areas, like New York City would be one of those examples, depending on where they're all kind of gathering. And right now they're not, but when things start to reopen, those are going to be questions we have to assess. Um, Who have these people been with? You know, have they been out and about? Did they go to church over the weekend? Are they wearing masks? Have they been shopping a lot? Those are all factors that you're going to have to start to ask. Um, And the other thing, too, is the hair salon, the nail salon, it's critical that both the employee and the patron wears the mask. So you as a customer and them as the provider of service need to be both wearing masks. Um, And there are a lot that are not doing it. I see that here in Georgia. Low to medium for all my Floridians and folks that are on the water, Beaches are in the low medium risk category. Um, There are a lot of great ways to kind of section yourself off. Then also different times sometimes are going to be less populated. Unfortunately, Florida, depending on your coast, sunrise, there might be more people out on the East Coast, on the West Coast, it might be sunset. So you might want to kind of factor into and even assessing where when's the least populated time and go then. Um, I also do like the beaches have the density of the saltwater air. Walking along the seashore is very detoxing. You get the ionization. It moves your lymphatics. It's very pro-supportive of your immune and lymphatic health. Low risk would be outdoor dining. So on the lower risk side, outdoor dining is a low risk if the 
they maintain six feet from the table chairs, not the table themselves, but the table chair. So, you know, somebody's seated in a chair and the next person is here and that's really only three feet, but the table is six feet. That's not, that's not the proper, proper social distance. It's six feet to six feet from the person sitting at the table. And a lot of restaurants have actually just pulled tables. So they don't even have people there. I've seen some, if you watch CBS Sunday morning, they had a few that they're literally dressing up mannequins. <laughs> so, you know, to preserve and just create a sense that there are more people there, but also to limit, uh, you know, the ability for people to take over where a mannequin is sitting. Um, the other thing too, is just being cognizant of the high touch items, condiments, uh, salt, pepper, ketchup, mustard, any of, you know, the kind of sauces and things that you might grab and put on your food. That's a high touch item. And while I know restaurants are trying to be safe, that could be very easily missed. So make sure if you do have your wipes, bring them with you, clean off all those things if you're going to touch them. Um, and, and ensure, make sure that they're using disposable items and wear. Now, low risk also is going to be outdoor activities. So hiking, trailing, you know, walking on trails, being outside, but minimizing a 15 minute encounter with other people. So let's say you're hiking and you get to a kind of checkpoint or a viewpoint and there's a lot of people there. You don't want to stay there for 15 minutes with a lot of people in that space there's a high risk, especially when you don't know those individuals. Um, the other thing, retail shopping. So retail shopping is in the low risk. If you're wearing a mask and you're the store, you have the ability to social distance, but for sure our store should not have the fitting rooms open. Those should not be open. Um, and uh, what is recommended, I don't think retailers are going to do this, but what's re recommended if clothing piece has been touched by another individual, even, you know, you kind of put something up, you're like, oh, does this dress fit me? Or how does this look on me? That clothing item technically should be in quarantine or quarantined for a few days. Well, retailers now, we they business owners, we, we're hurting. And, you know, I consider myself in that category we don't have always four or five days to quarantine an item that's been picked up and assessed by an individual. So that's a challenge. And with us, you know, everybody wants to try on clothing to see if it fits. And ideally, if you know that something's going to fit you and you're going to wear it, you're not going to take it back. You buy it, you wash it, and then you try it on. Um, I don't, I don't know how that's going to work with returns though, because you can't, you've used it, you own it you washed it and there are no tags on it. So that's going to be a little bit of a challenge with clothing. Um, but the most, the heavy points, the risky points in retail shopping are your counters, the high frequented counters, checkouts, conveyor belt, where you, you put all your stuff on and then also bathrooms. So make sure if you are going to go retail shopping, depending in that strict category. And, you know, if you're retail shopping, uh, you know, essential would fall into retail shopping. Um, so even strict level, you know, one or two and three, you know, you want to, you want to go in and out. You want to have your list. You want to go in. I mentioned yesterday, you want to do like my, you know, mail shopping, like Brian, you know, goes to the mall. He like knows exactly what pair of clothing he wants, the size, color. He goes, he doesn't even try it in. Goes, goes, grabs it, checks out. He's in and out in like 10 minutes. I go to the mall. I could be there for hours because I'm hunting and get, you know, I'm, I'm gathering. <laughs> so we, that's going to be a challenge for us. Um, you know, gatherers in the world who like to check out targets, dollar bins and, you know, enjoys mommy time at a store or boutique. Um, so we definitely have had, had things change. Um, but those, you know, the other low risk are going to be your mail and groceries. I still clean them because my mail carrier, despite me giving her gloves and a mask, she still won't wear those. So, you know, and I just, I'm not taking a risk. Um, so if you can spot your mail carrier and see, are they wearing masks and gloves? You know, most, mostly the mask is most important. Okay. So Carol St. Andrew says, oh, I'm lucky. I hate shopping in and out. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I miss it. I miss all the fines. Um, but, you know, we'll get back to that level at some point. But the good news, I'm actually liquidating all of our clothing, Gabriel's clothing, and posting on eBay. 
So I'm slowly going through getting rid of stuff we don't use and wear. Um, but, you know, the big thing is, is just know your tolerance. Everybody has different tolerance level, you know, and some are going to be less risky or feel like they're okay taking a risk. That's totally fine. I don't, nobody judges you. But the thing is, is that folks that are not wearing masks are putting others at risk. And this is where these, the three to five, we need to be, cog they need to be cognizant of potential risk and harm to others. So Instagram, you guys are going to tune off. Um, I've got to wrap this up because actually Gabriel has a uh, last uh, week of school meeting with this teacher, but tune in tomorrow, you guys. Thanks for tuning in. All right. So let me just save this. So YouTube, thank you for tuning in. I want to um, address some questions. Lydia, why does zinc make me throw up every time? Oh gosh. Even when taken with food, sometimes a, a little one, it's powerful. My uh, trace psionic minerals, I have to have a full stomach of food and then I have to put in water. You don't want to just put it in your mouth. It can literally be so overwhelming. It makes me salivate thinking about it. Um, zinc can do that. Um, so what I would do is I would splice out your dosage of zinc and have it be, you take a little bit, like I take two drops in the morning when I wake up, I have my water from the night before I put the drops in, I get my zinc with my minerals. Um, and then at lunch after lunch and literally like I take that and I eat immediately. Um, and, but if I don't eat immediately, I'll start to feel nauseous. Um, I lunch, I take it after I eat lunch and then after dinner, uh, but very common, but that's a good potent, potent zinc. That's, uh, an unfortunate side effect, but if you do it right and you splice it out, uh, that will lower that experience. Uh, yeah. So Pat, they use mannequins. I actually dressed them up in like 1940s. <laughs> they even had like food. I don't know if they had real food or fake food, but they were, it was really cute. Um, drive-in movie theaters are definitely making a comeback. Um, Dwayne, you've been in stores that are requiring employees to wear masks and they aren't properly wearing masks. Nose is sticking out, masks not snug on them. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Um, you know, the last time I ventured out now was two weeks ago and we went to pick up some, uh, garden items and I called around. I found one a little North of where we live. I've shopped, I've, I've gotten roses with them before. I know their, their place. I talked to the woman she was like, yep. You know, I could tell she probably wasn't in agreement with the whole lockdown, but whatever. She's like, we're wearing masks. We've got pickup. We'll just put in your, in your trunk. I roll up. She comes up. She's got her mask down here. <laughs> you know, I've got my mask. Gabriel's got his mask. My trunk is open and she made some comment. And I said to her, I said, you know, it's much better wearing a mask here out in this beautiful environment than it is in an, in an ICU bed. And she was like, yeah, you're right. And she actually pulled it up. And, you know, I wasn't trying to be rude, but I wanted to highlight the fact that like, you know, let's stop complaining about stuff like the selfishness that we have. It's just a mask. I mean, are we going to have to wear this forever? No. But, you know, what's worse? What's the alternative? I don't want to land in a hospital or have Brian or anybody I know or any of you land yourselves in a hospital because you thought this way or somebody you encounter is like negligent. And that I, I consider that to be negligent. That's my two cents. I sometimes get in trouble with you guys if I give you my two cents, but you know, it really, we have to, we have to be realistic with this negligence and selfishness is killing people. Um, and it's just gone, it's gone beyond ignorance. Um, you know, we can tolerate ignorance, but you know, negligence, it's intolerable. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, John's enough. Yeah. So here's, here's the sign of ignorance, um, fake numbers, empty hospitals and falsifying death certificates. Like those statements completely unfactually founded. If anything, the numbers are articulating that we're not, uh, we're not attributing enough numbers to people who are dying at home alone, not having been tested in cardiac arrest or from these major complications from the virus. Um, some of the hospitals that might have empty areas are because they were trying to allocate resources, staffing, PPE, and other resources to the COVID units. So, <clears throat> you know, there, there is, there's, there's more to it than just making those broad statements. And people like John are just completely ill-informed and want to state 
information that is not factually um, balanced. And, you know, just to like pop it on a live chat, just this, it's negligent, it's harmful. And, you know, just doing that and running off. Well, I'm sorry, you just can't do that. It's like dropping a grenade, back it up, back up your data. Tell us the reasons why you think that. And most of the time you're going to find it's completely inaccurate. It's just absolutely annoying. Um, okay. So what do I think about Arsenic album? I like it. I like it a lot. I love homeopathics. Um, that is, can be good for stress, can be good for some hair loss as well. Um, ah, Joanne, thank you. Um, let's see. Do, could you talk about our single album? I won't in today's video, um, but I have in the past, I have a few homeopathic related videos. Um, let's see, Carla, masks are for aerosols that leave our mouths that carry the virus more than preventing us getting the virus. So it's important. So many people are asymptomatic and that is absolutely so true. Um, and there's, there's, you know, there's the right way to wear it and there's the wrong way to wear it. And oh, I see we have a live super chat. Yay, Carol. Oh, thank you. She says, thank you for all your medical data. I love the real data and all the useful info. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yay. Thank you. Uh, Nancy says, I don't understand what would be the purpose of having all those fake numbers. I don't understand these conspiracy type people. The numbers are definitely under what they actually are. Yes. Um, and it's, you know, we just have to think about this. this is a serious crisis. And when you're in crisis mode, um, you're in the thick of it. Like New York and New Jersey, they're in the thick of it. I mean, they still, while their numbers are on the decline, they have a substantial amount of cases um, and a lot are active. So, you know, when a, a person goes into the hospital and eventually they're there for two or three weeks, that's a long time. So it definitely is something where, um, you know, there's just a subset of people that think that way. And I'm okay with people thinking differently, but where we have to draw the line is when their thinking is now harming others. And this, this is that time. This is the time where that type of, uh, you know, maybe they have a lower th threshold or tolerance level. And, you know, it's interesting, this, this woman, they're not my words, but from what she's put together, you know, may desire to get infected. I mean, that could very well be possible, but you know, to evaluate that, like there's a Florida gentleman who totally thought this was fake, you know, leaned into all of the kind of nonsense. And he's laid up in a hospital realizing that he could die of this. And he's got, you know, breathing, you know, oxygen and, and very concerned. And that is unfortunate because I think a lot of people, if they got to that level, they start thinking differently. Unfortunately, I wish we could have got to them before they got there. Um, so it just is what it is. Um, so anyway, uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Uh, Dwayne says, I'm an essential worker. I work and go out with a mask, carry hand sanitizer and use when I come out of a store, have gloves for gas. I'm single, so I have to go to the stores. Um, and Dwayne, are you in an area where you can have that ordered in? Because maybe that could at least lower your risk factor. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm moderately open. I don't think the mask helps, but I do wash my hands when I get don't, done shopping, et cetera, Kathy. You know, it might not necessarily help you um, per se, but it does lower. Like if you're going out and about and let's say you catch it. The other thing is our eyes. I need to do a video specifically about our eyes. Um, if you're not covering your eyes, you have a risk. You have a risk, friends. Um, and this could very well be the main source of our spread that we're not really assessing. And again, that's some speculation, but also from some folks that are, are laid up in the hospital, having taken a lot of precautions and that was the one area they didn't protect. And we know the eyes is a transmission point. So, you know, even if you are wearing a mask, if you're not covering, even if you don't wear a mask, you're not covering your eyes, you know, you need to cover all those areas. So take all the precautions. And I would say, Dwayne, I would, I would wear some sort of clear kind of uh, cover. And if you guys want, I could, I could bring that to highlight in tomorrow's video the eyes. So just let me know down below, but it is, it is very critical. We do need to protect ourselves and others. If you are out and about, especially if you have low risk, you need to be wearing them. If you're not going to stay home and you're not going to be diligent about your quarantining, 
and lowering your risk. If you're out and about, if you're in three or low, three to five, you need to be wearing 100% of the time. You need to be sanitizing. You need to have goggles on. That's going to lower your transmission factors, but also others, because you might not have symptoms for three or four days when you're out and about. Guess what? You're infecting other people. Can you live with yourself like that? Like, that's one of those things. Are you okay with potentially causing harm to, let's say, an immune compromised six year old who just had a heart valve replacement and her parent has to get diapers? and baby food for her younger sister. And she goes to Trader Joe's just like you do or wherever. You guys come into some contact, you sneeze, you're not wearing a mask, you're asymptomatic, you're not feeling symptoms. And that mom is literally in and out of the store, just caught the virus from you. Can you live with that? I mean, those are things we have to think about. Most people are not okay with that. Uh, you know. So anyway, it's just something to think about. Monica, oh, thank you, 1999. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Carol and Monica, I really appreciate the super chats this morning. Um, so I'm a little bit on my soapbox, but um, okay. So we'll talk about eyes tomorrow. Yeah. And Kay Jefferson, I couldn't live my, with myself. And the thing is, is that we're just starting contact tracing. We may or may not know who we've been impacted or infected, but there will be, as we get more tuned into this, as we get more organized and that's coming, you might end up getting a call. You've either been exposed or somebody you've exposed. So um, it's definitely a factor. Okay, so let's tune in tomorrow. Thank you, Monica. Super chat. I love, look at her cute little emoji, her little like person. I love that. So cute. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you and all of you for tuning in. Um, it looks like YouTube is going to take this video. So woo -woo, we had a successful day. And we want to give Lumen some love, a link to buy this product. They're multi-collagen. I really am very happy to work with them. It's a really easy uh, supplement to take. You can, you know, open it up, put it in whatever you want to put it in and enhance your collagen. So that does support your gut and your immune system, sleep, hair, all the good things, minimizes crow's feet. <laughs> all right, friends, tune in tomorrow. I appreciate all of you. And I look forward to... Uh, seeing you tomorrow. We'll talk about protecting your eyes next. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.